Welcome back to Power Hour, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us, caring about your world. We've had so many requests for our guest, Professor James McCanny, to be on the program. He, everyone loves to hear what he has to say. He's not an alarmist, and that's what people like, is that he is a realist, if you will. And uh, that's what we want to hear from people like Scott Portsline, is what is the reality of the situation. Uh, he joins us here today, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit of his background, because I love his background and love what he brings to the table when he comes on the Power Hour. Professor McCanny, thank you so much for joining us today on the Power Hour. Hi, Joyce. Good morning to everybody. Hi there. Good morning, and thank you for joining you us. I want to hear a little uh, bit you about your background. My... Yeah, your background from you as to why it is that I respect so much what you have to say. Talk to me about your background. Well, uh, I have a very good background in physics and mathematics. My college education, which occurred uh, back in the uh, 60s, I have a double major in physics and mathematics, so I uh, have a well-rounded background. Um, I also, uh, I should mention this, took courses like ethics that they don't give anymore. <laughs> in, uh, yeah. Harvard stopped giving the uh, ethics course. But anyway, uh, also, uh, I went off after I finished college and just, I said, I'm not ready for graduate school. The graduate school that I chose uh, held my uh, my fellowship for three years, and they said, uh, you can come back at any time in this three years. So I went off and I started traveling the world. And I, I didn't know what I was looking for, but in retrospect now as an older person, I really see things that uh, somebody was moving me to go and see parts of the world. And I could give a lot of examples of that. But then I came back. I got my master's degree at Tulane University in physics, uh, nuclear physics and solid state physics. And then I returned to Latin America where I taught in the university for four years and also kept up my studies. That's why I uh, did a lot of basic work on my Calculate Primes work, which later, decades later, finally came to fruition. And uh, also I worked on uh, what is called the three-body problem in physics. It's a mathematical, trying to understand mathematically the moving movements of the celestial bodies. At that point, I said, well, let's put in electric and magnetic fields instead of just gravitational fields. And I started to understand the very subtle concepts of electromagnetic uh, interactions in outer space. Uh, it was in 19... Uh, uh, 79 that I, uh, by a chance, uh, moved to Ithaca, New York, and I went into Cornell University to uh, ask if I could get my Ph.D. there, if I could go back to school, and and when I talked to uh, the head of the physics department after reviewing my credentials, he says, well, we're really booked up here for many years in advance with the graduate program, but you can teach here, and I, I just about fell off my chair. Uh, mm -hmm. it, so I got a job teaching at Cornell University Physics Department, uh, introductory physics, and it was there that I had access to NASA data coming in from the planet. It was the first time that we had seen Jupiter, Venus up close, Saturn, etc. And as I sat in the meetings uh, with the NASA scientists, these were daily at Cornell because Cornell had a lot of NASA scientists. I was realizing all of my work, theoretical work, on electromagnetism in outer space. While the NASA scientists were befuddled, everything that came in, they had no idea what was going on. So I started to write papers, and they were getting published in European journals. All of a sudden, kind of the hammer came down, and I didn't really, really realize what was going on, but little did I know that Carl Sagan was at Cornell. I knew he was there, but... Um, he had led the charge in the entire scientific community against a guy named Emmanuel Velikovsky, who claimed there was electromagnetism in outer space, that Venus was a giant comet uh, back in historical times, back in the, about 4,000 years ago, and on and on and on. So I had fallen into a hornet's nest, didn't really realize it, so I'm using NASA data to prove that outer space is electrical, electrically charged and, and a lot of electromagnetic effects. 
and I get kind of bounced out of there. And I'm just like, what's going on here? This is the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. So at that time, I had also associations with the mathematics department. So I walked across campus and I got rehired by the mathematics department at Cornell to teach mathematics. And uh, so I taught there for another year and a half. Uh, but anyway, at the same time, kept publishing my papers and doing my theoretical work, which is the basis for everything I'm doing now, the weather work, uh, the work on comets, uh, the understanding that comets can under affect the sun, uh, even at a distance, the concept that I call action at a distance, where comets and other planetary objects can affect each other. I learned uh, how weather is really created electrically in outer space, and that if we didn't have electricity in outer space, we wouldn't have any weather on Earth at all. Okay. Anyway, that's the that's the uh, brief history brings us up to today. And the the other thing I did work on uh, in the background is my mathematical work dealing with prime numbers. And a number of years ago, I cracked the oldest mathematical problem in the world the direct calculation of the prime numbers. And that, I have a book out for the general public. It's called Calculate Primes. And it also is a very important uh, 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 result because it destroys the RSA codes that were used for secure computing and firewalls. Uh, for uh, uh, Another half of my career, I should mention, was in industry. I worked in the telecommunications industry for about uh, probably 25 years and about probably 12 years uh, as a professor, university professor, teaching everything from physics to mathematics and everything in between. So I have a very rich background, and uh, it's odd because every time something happens, like the issue we're going to talk about today, the uh, Grid X2, I seem to be uh, fall into the middle of a giant controversy uh, because I see how these things are elected, uh, how science and technology are being used against the public. Uh, and uh, so that brings us somewhat up to today where uh, the NERC, the North American Electric and Reliability Corporation, which is a very strange entity. It has no power uh, in, in the sense of affecting anything directly, but they're having a international power outage exercise called Grid X2 this coming November 13th and 14th. Uh, so uh, that, this is a huge issue, uh, Joyce, and uh, it's coordinated with some government announcements. Uh, so that, uh, for example, Homeland Security has reiterated that we are 100% sure it is imminent. We are going to have an international, naturally caused by the way, 100% sure grid power outage caused from a natural event and this is going to be simultaneous with a cyber attack mind you and so we'll get into that too what does this mean to the average person out there by the way uh, a cyber attack means no banking no credit cards no internet uh, the government agencies will be affected potentially power grids outages because of cyber attacks in addition to the physical power outages that they're predicting. And uh, what is amazing about all of this is nobody is doing anything to prevent it. Okay, but in defense of reality, though, we are looking at just an exercise that's coming up November 13, 14. There is nothing beyond the exercise, such as loss of power that we know of, is there? Or have they decided to go ahead and make it more realistic? But the November 13th, 14th planned exercise is a basically a Homeland Security a Chinese fire drill uh, where everybody's going to jump up and down. They call them players. Well, so you might be a, a manager of a power system in Ohio, or you might be the uh, person, a procurement agent for a company in New York of nuclear power plants. So these they call players. So all these people will be jumping up and down, uh, going through all kinds of drills to uh, stimulate a real power outage, but nobody is ordering more equipment. Nobody is putting uh, uh, any real meat into this uh, exercise. So 
about what they're going to do is report to government agencies. Uh, one thing I noticed in some of the uh, coordinated responses to this is that some people are very, in, in the player list, so to speak, they're very resistant to have their data shipped off to police agencies, the FBI, other government agencies like Homeland Security. They're going, you know, what's all this, this all about? And my way of seeing it is that uh, North American Electric Reliability Corporation is just kind of what I call tier two. They're kind of a dumb middle management agencies, but they're doing the work. They're doing the bidding of a much higher uh, reality, and, and that is, what they're doing is there's going to, this is going to get so much publicity that the public is going to be mentally trained, so to speak, to accept this power outage and then also uh, on the, the side, the cyber attack that's coming, and uh, to, to accept it as a naturally occurring event, uh, that somehow nature is doing this. And what I've said all along, and I started sensing this, smelling this uh, a couple years ago, NASA came out a couple years ago as we headed into this uh, current solar maximum that we're at right now, which, by the way, is probably the weakest in 200 years. Uh, All right, we got to go to this four-minute break. We're going to come back and talk about this solar maximum, the weakest in 200 years, as well as <clears throat> what is... The Grid X2 all about. Remember, there was Grid X1 a couple of years ago. Grid X2 is coming up in November. We'll be back with Professor James McCanny after this break. Stay tuned for a minute. Welcome back to the Power Hour, ladies and gentlemen. I think it ought to be America Bless God at this point. That is Steve Voss. Praise and patriotism available at the Power Mall. Call 877-817-9829. Please support the Power Mall and support Steve Voss. We need this man singing the songs that tell the truth. Uh, we're going to be short this week at the Power Mall again, and please be patient with us. We've got an illness situation and some other things, and just please be patient with us, if you will, at the Power Mall. Um, Joining us today is our guest, Professor James McCanny, talking about the events that are about to take place, Grid X2 being one of them, along with the solar maxim. Now, Grid X2, maximum, this Grid X2 being an exercise that the government is, is going to do, let's define what that Grid X2 is. How, I, I mean, I've seen the, the write-up on the, the exercise. I still don't get a feel, though, for how interactive it's going to be within the United States. Can you shed any light on that for us, uh, Professor? Uh, yeah, Joyce. When you read the NERC uh, guidelines and uh, what they call their objectives or mission statements, whatever you might call them, they're extremely vague, extremely vague. Um, they don't have any power. They're simplement. Uh, they're just a. Uh, they're a recommendation uh, organization. They don't carry any teeth at all. It's very difficult to figure out where their money comes from, and uh, so for them to come out. And in fact, most of their uh, recommendations are like trainer or, or um, what do you call, operator training, standards, uh, things like this. So, in, in fact, they actually explicitly say in their uh, bylaws that they are not uh, for this type of action, yet they're coming out and doing this. And to really understand who is behind this uh, and what their objective is, I, you have to read between the lines. Yeah. So my interpretation is is that they really don't, uh, they think they're doing a good job, as with many Tier 2 level organizations. They're being used to implement this. Now, remember, NERC is a private corporation. It's privately funded. It's not a government agency. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty convenient. The government loves to do this, to push this off onto somebody that's totally independent, so this is not Homeland Security, it's not the FBI, it's not uh, NSA or some other agency directly. But you have to see all of the intentions of these agencies involved here. Uh, if uh, What I see is crowd control. 
when the government agencies get involved, then the question is, if we have a power outage, how can we implement crowd control? Because obviously, if the power goes out, it's going to be a giant mess. Uh, if you have uh, nuclear power plants going down, uh, or if you have uh, transformers on high-voltage, uh, high-tension transport lines that affect large areas, uh, we're going to have some real social problems, and that's been one of the, the issues. Uh, you won't be able to get gasoline. Basic infrastructure will be shut down. Uh, there will be looting. There will be people out of food. They say New York City has a three-hour supply of food. Okay, but are we talking here, and I want to make sure we differentiate, are we talking here in terms of exercise? Are they going to actually put into practice some of these issues or have test issues? I mean, do we know that they're going to go outside the realm of uh, paperwork for this exercise? Actually, Joyce, I cannot determine that. I've been trying to answer that question. Is this an exercise? Are they going to actually pull the plug somewhere? Uh, remember, it was about a year ago, San Diego had a power outage. They finally blamed it on some disgruntled worker who did something, and the people in the business laughed at it, and they said, this is absurd. You can't just have some guy go in and pull a thing, and all of a sudden, all of San Diego goes down. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I think it's an exercise. I think it's going to be a paper exercise. But it's preparing the public mentally for a real... All right. We'll be back. Three-minute break. Stay tuned to the Power Hour. This is Joyce Riley and Professor McCann. We'll be right back. We're joined by uh, Professor James McCanney talking about GridX2 and whether or not this is going to go outside the realm of just strictly being an exercise. Um, I don't know, but I know that if there were to take down any power grid in any major city in the country, I mean, can you imagine what would happen in Detroit or New York or Chicago or any place major? I can't even conceive what would be the situation. And, And my fear is that they would do it just for a trial run. I mean, can you conceive of them doing something that would be so uh, deadly to this country? Uh, absolutely. Uh, remember that our little event back there, 9-11, there was, unknown, unbeknownst to the public, there was an operation going on behind the scene, and that's why air traffic controllers did not do anything, did not react to the planes out of place. Uh, other planes that shouldn't have been there, planes moving. Um, we still don't really know the shell game that went on with airplanes on that day, but uh, it was partially due to the fact that air traffic controllers were not uh, watching because uh, uh, they were told that there was some kind of secret operation going on. Uh, so is this a cover for something that's going on, or is it simply something that uh, prepping the public to accept power outages due to uh, a, a natural event. And they're stress, stressing natural events here, although they say EMPs can be caused by nuclear bombs, etc. But here's what I've always said uh, since NASA started uh, really pounding on this a couple years ago. I said, why is NASA so imminent, uh, pounding on this imminent power outage due to the solar flare? When we are in the weakest solar cycle in 200 years, we're, we're the least likely to have a Carrington-style power event or power surge event. We are the least likely right now in this solar cycle. Uh, look at this year with hurricanes. We haven't had any. Uh, that's because the solar cycle is so weak. In, in August, we're into September, still no hurricane. Uh, and that's a direct result of a very weak solar cycle. Uh, but the, the point is, I started smelling this, that they're, they're getting ready to pull the plug on the electric grid as a way of bringing in the new world order. And so I see this event as a way of prepping the public mentally to accept a power outage due to a natural event. Uh, another coincident event here is that uh, something I've been studying all along, and by the way, uh, Comet Ison. 
there's a tremendous amount of misinformation coming from NASA and from uh, private sources on YouTube, et cetera, about Comet Ison and is it Wormwood? No, it's not Wormwood. Uh, all kinds of things. NASA okay, what would Wormwood uh, mean to someone who doesn't know the name Wormwood? What would that mean? Well, like a planet X, something that's going to, a celestial object that would come in and destroy the Earth, uh, that type of thing. Uh, I, Comet Ison is not any of those. It's actually relatively a uh, benign comet. Uh, NASA came out saying it was the comet of the century. Uh, it's a very small comet, really. It, uh, and I doubt uh, that it's going to pan out to be what they predicted, the comet of the century. But what's interesting, even small comets can have effects in the right conditions. November 10th to 14th, Comet Ison will have a very close electrical alignment, right coming right in the backside of the planet Mercury, which is the closest planet to the Sun. And so that could begin an era when Comet Ison is uh, basically electrically uh, pumping up the energy of the Sun, in which we could have a lot of uh, CMEs, a lot of solar activity within that next couple of weeks. And so what I see is this exercise pulling off the public's mental uh, capacity or the memory of the public is very short. So what I see, this is coupled with uh, Janet Napolitano. Uh, I can never say her name, but... Uh, Napolitano. 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 <laughs> uh, the ex-Homeland Security and other uh, people in Homeland Security saying, along with a whole laundry list of senators... Uh, congressmen, congresswomen saying that we are 100% sure of having a, a grid, a high 100% uh, uh, grid outage here due to a natural event, along with, and this is the part that I find strange, a cyber attack. Uh, on That means no banking, no credit cards. Uh, and by the way, I'll just interject this so I don't forget it on the show. Anybody who has e-billing, for credit cards, for the utility bill, for your house payments, whatever, print out your statements. Print them out so you have a record and keep them current for the next few months at least. Because if the if the computer systems go down, if there is a major cyber attack, uh, you will not have a record of your payments, of where you are in your credit history. And that printed sheet will be the only thing you have to prove your payments, your past payment history. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you're just bringing up thoughts of absolute chaos in this country of what would happen in the financial and regulatory industry with the with the the event taking place if it were and we know the grid can go down at any time i mean it could go down in 15 minutes from now we know that so these are important things i'm glad that that you're saying this the people things that people need to do i also want to open up the phone lines and allow a couple of you if you have an entertaining question a question for professor McCanny. get in in the line at 855-995 6923-855-995-6923. If you have a question or comment on target, on focus, on subject for Professor James McCanny, 855-995-6923. What else would be important for people to have? I mean, all of their information and documents that we now store online because it is so convenient, people need to get a hard copy of these and put them in a safe place. Absolutely, because if, if the bank goes down or the credit card company goes down or even your electric bill, how are you going to prove that you have paid up to a certain point? And if they come back to you and say, well, no, uh, our records restored show this, uh, you, you're going to be standing there with your finger up your nose, and you're going to owe that money, and any court on the planet will support that. So you have to have your own paperwork. Uh, but other than that, be prepared. What I always say is, like any preparedness, you need what well, the first thing you need is water, a source of water, your own source of water. Uh, you need uh, food. You need to all of those preparedness items. It's going to be at the beginning of winter. Uh, prepare to have a tent in your apartment or your, your house. Uh, you will stay much warmer in a very small tent if you don't have heat. 
Oh, I never uh, thought of that. that a tent. A, a tent. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but that is an incredible idea. A tent in a, in your apartment could make you so much warmer than just, you know, having, oh, that's awesome. Good information. I never thought of that. If, if you have a fireplace, I actually had this in my house, my old house, uh, not in that house anymore, but I had a, uh, like a canvas cabin tent, a 12 by 12, like you see at these uh, historical events. Uh, and then I had an airtight wood stove, which was portable, just kind of a little light one, and it went into the chimney, went into my fireplace, which was just a normal fireplace. And it kind of went in and up, just a short piece of stove pipe, and I could actually stay in there and have heat uh, in, uh, in that small area, but reduce the area, be prepared to shut off rooms like bedrooms that don't have plumbing, uh, and reduce if if you do have uh, the ability to run your furnace at all. But there's all kinds of things you can do in a city to be prepared. So uh, uh, have a sleeping bag, uh, be prepared, because, uh, Joyce, one time I spent from about May to about the next February living up in central Canada, up in the Northwest Territories of Central Canada. And I lived outside. I did not have a shelter. I didn't have a house. It's amazing what you can do uh, if you're prepared and have the proper clothes and equipment, et cetera. So uh, I, all of these things have water, food, and I would say be prepared for six months. Don't uh, plan on eating big suppers and big meals. Eat once a day very lightly because you're not going to be moving around. But be prepared, and I also suggest that people do their own preparation Take a weekend with the family, shut off the electric, shut off the gas, shut off the water, and, and then sit around and stare at each other and figure out how you're going to live if this were going to continue for six months. Remember, your toilet won't work, sewage will not work. What are you going to do? Uh, become prepared. And there are solutions for all of this, but uh, become prepared because Homeland Security has told us there is imminent 100% chance of a wide-scale power outage and cyber attack. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the writing is there. I don't know how much more clear. That is not me saying it. I'm repeating okay. what the head of Homeland Security said in her final departing message to the public. And now, how can they make these predictions? And I also have to say, if they know this is coming, certainly they can prevent it. Uh, like the NERC exercise coming up November 14th. Uh, Nobody is talking about how to prepare to have equipment ready to reinstall. Uh, nobody's buying extra transformers uh, in terms of the cyber attack. Nobody is hardening, uh, hardening our, our defenses against cyber attack, how to bring things offline in case a cyber attack begins so that we have uh, preserve our uh, integrity in the computing systems. Nobody's talking about that. It's just like we're standing here with our pants down and it's going to happen, you know. Uh, this is so incredible. But they're saying it's 100% imminent going to happen, which tells me is that they're just letting it happen. They're, gonna, they're just going to let it happen. And it's going to happen as far as I can tell. And what, the other thing is you have to understand is these people are all little minions. They're little workers in the New World Order. This, to me, signals the changing of the world banking system, the world uh, economic system, uh, the stock market. Everything that we call normal is going to change overnight. Without a doubt. Absolutely. I mean, change upside down. And that's why I know I'm encouraging people, if they live on a certain item, I mean, they thrive on it, need it, whether it's toothpaste or whether it's whatever, kitty litter, I don't care what it is, get it now. Because, uh, you know, even books, because that's going to be a time for reading books. People need to be ready to entertain themselves, as you said. You know, the old Xbox or whatever kids play today is not going to be there. So I, I really second everything you're saying. You know, I've been going out buying bandages, hydrogen peroxide, you know, all these kinds of things, so that when it comes, you have everything you need. And if you don't have it right now, then go get it. Um, let me go to Johnny B. in Missouri. Johnny B., you're on the air. Go ahead, please, with Professor McCanny. Go ahead. Hey, good morning, Joyce. Professor morning. McCanny. Uh, I've got a question 
Professor, if, uh, if are you aware that there was a comet that went by the sun either in uh, February of 06 or 07 that was twice the size of Jupiter? So there, uh, do you have a name for that comet? Because there's many, many, many that have uh, done that. Well, yeah, but how many of them are twice the size of the planet Jupiter? Uh, well, the, let me say this. It's something I work on. And uh, a comet uh, about a year and a half ago called Comet Lovejoy came around the sun, and it lost its tail as it passed through the solar atmosphere. People on Earth, looking up in the early morning sky, saw it, saw it like bigger than the planet Mercury. Then it redeveloped the tail. Uh, NASA said it was a 600-foot nucleus, 200 meters. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> you could see it. Uh, uh, you know, 200 meters like a, a naval ship. Now, are you going to be able to see a naval ship next to the sun standing on Earth in the morning sky? No. Uh, this was big. So, yeah, common oh. nuclei are big. And one of the biggest lies of NASA is the size of comet nuclei. It is, it is incredible the amount of whitewashing they do to lie about the size of comet nuclei. Uh, but, uh, yes, uh, they can be big, and I, you'd have to give me a name so I could make a better comment on the one you're talking about. All right, okay. thank you very well, I'd much. Have to, I'd have to okay. dig it up, but the, uh, right. the actual... Johnny B., let me move on. I've got a lot of callers that want to talk to him. I want to ask uh, one question per person, if you don't mind. Ralph in Connecticut, you're on the air with Professor McCanny. Go ahead, please, Ralph. Professor McCanny, have you ever considered the theory about uh, the conversion of dark matter into real matter? and how it relates to the magnetic uh, field of the planet? Uh, first of all, I don't believe in dark matter. It's a, it's a point that's way off point of what we're talking about here. Not really. Uh, so but to explain you why it would be on point, because it's, it's the only thing that would explain why the sun would become energetic all of a sudden. And no, putting uh, out actually what happens is they, the comet is uh, basically a discharge of the electrical capacitor, and uh, this is based on my theoretical work dealing with comets. They're not dirty snowballs. The and so the... Uh, the uh, Ralph, I mean, Ralph, your, your phone is so bad, I can't let you on any longer, unfortunately. It's really, really difficult to hear you. Uh, go ahead, Professor. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, November 13th, 14th, in that time frame, Comet Ison is going to be... Little planet Mercury is going to be uh, winging around in its orbit. Comet Ison comes right up behind it, perfect electrical alignment with the sun. And we're going to see the comet excited. I, I said even planet Mercury might go comet, in which uh, planet Mercury, we would actually see it develop a tail, like a comet tail. That's a possibility. But the biggest thing is that this discharge could start booming the sun with some CMEs, coronal mass ejections, and solar flares, and it could be going off like a loose cannon. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they're going to hit Earth. That's the second question. Uh, that's actually a low probability. But what I've been saying is that's the time when they're going to use a solar flare as a false flag event. Aha. Uh, now we get to it. So you're talking about Comet Ison being used as a false flag. Oh, my gosh, here it comes, and then it hits, and then it's their false flag event and they created it. All right, we're going to come back after this three-minute break with our guest, Professor James McCanny. Get ready, ladies and gentlemen. November 13, 14 is the date, and it'll all be in the email blast, so you can follow it. Sign up for the email blast. Back in three minutes. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Power Hour. Thanks for joining us. We are talking to Professor James McCanny. Now, the important statement that I want you to hear is one he just told me during the break, which has to do with grid X and what that means following grid X. It is not necessarily grid X. It is what comes after that. Do you want to go ahead and fill that in for the people uh, before we go back to the next caller, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor McCanny? Yes, exactly, Joyce. Uh, the November 13th to 14th grid X exercise, grid X2, is, from what I can tell, is a exercise that will uh, basically be high publicity. It'll get the public's mindset ready 
the actual event that I see that Napolitano is talking about and all the other senators will come later. And so I don't know how much later, but uh, I doubt that they would do a cyber attack power outage during a well-publicized exercise like this. This is Oh, no. Oh, this country would it. never do that. They would never do that in conjunction. No. 9-11, uh, let's see, all the other events, Sandy Hook, that were all exercises. I mean, that's why the average person doesn't know about Grid X, though, sir. The average person has no idea right. what we're talking about here. So these are the enlightened. These are the educated people. And so the rest of the world wouldn't know about it. So if it came at the same time of Grid X, hey, they wouldn't even know. Yeah, so I don't know, Joyce. I, to answer your question, that's my scenario that I think. Uh, okay. That November 13th to 14th is not the, going to be the event, although uh, it could be. Uh, just like uh, during 9-11, there was a, 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 a air traffic controllers were told to stand down because there was some kind of exercise going on. Uh, and so uh, this could be something similar that yes. people think they're in an exercise when actually there's an actual uh, grid outage. Uh, I want to point out, too, that during a real solar flare outage, uh, even like the Carrington event, not all of the power grid would go down all across the world. There would be bits and pieces that would survive. And in my way of doing it, if you were the New World Order and you wanted to usher in complete control, you would not want little pockets with successful electric grid activity because the grid is just that it's small sections where the power is provided locally and then it can spill over or they can accept power from other areas of the grid that's how it's designed that's why it okay. is called the grid all uh, right so a real solar flare power outage would not take down everything they cannot have that they need a hundred percent compliance they need a hundred percent of the grid to go down and the general public doesn't understand this. So if a solar flare comes out, uh, even if it's not a big one, they could say, oh, that's the one that caused it, and then physically pull down the power grid everywhere. Oh, so wow. they could come in with complete control. Uh, your only communication would be on people would be hovering around, oh, you know, someone up the street has a radio. Everybody would be hovered around that radio listening to President Obama giving his little speech about how uh, to protect the children and the public. We have to all get together, and anybody that opposes what we do is against the public, the unified effort that we have to. I can just hear the speeches oh, coming yeah. out, you know. That and, is scary. Uh, that, uh, the, the economic, uh, we have to rebuild our economic system. We're going to have new monetary and banking. And, and uh, yeah, in fact, the government, and the, a lot of the people high up in banking would love to see a cyber attack where they could write off their own debt because in silver, in paper silver, paper gold, and other things, they are so far behind. Many banks have sold so much paper gold and silver that they can't possibly ever pay it off. That's why the price of gold and silver is being held artificially low. It should be much higher than it is right now. Uh, all right, we're so, going to come back so, after this. One minute, 10 second break. That's all we're going to be gone. One minute, 10 second. David in Texas, you're up next. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Take as many calls as we can. We have Ron Paul coming up at 8 after. Stay tuned. This is Joyce Riley and Professor McCann. It is straight up top of the hour. We're talking to Professor McCanny about Grid X2 and the ensuing whatever. Is it going to be false flag? Will it be martial law? A lot of heavy stuff we're talking about today, and we're going to talk with Ron Paul in the next um, segment. Um, let's go to David in Texas. David in Texas, you're on the air. Go ahead, please, quickly. Good morning, Joyce. Good morning. Uh, love your guest today. On a yeah. scale of 1 to 10, I'd say he's got to be a number 9, and I'm not sure who could be number 10, except for perhaps uh, maybe, maybe the Messiah. Uh, maybe the Messiah. Well, no, I was going to stop short of that. And, and that, that lady that calls from one of the Carolinas, oh, my gosh, I can't. Okay. All right, well, quickly, we don't have much time, oh, so that's going to uh, give professor, her a head for sure. Professor, uh, 
you raised a question on on one of your uh, comments uh, about how NASA has really just kind of become a storefront, a kind of a ruse for 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 making the American people believe that there's still some kind of space program. But yet Obama, and, and to a lesser degree even Bush, began cutting the budget of NASA a long time ago. But did they not kind of pull a fast one on us and allocate that money instead to the Air Force and the Navy, which really... They've launched more rockets than NASA ever thought about. Launching. Okay, let's go to that, and also, and also, along with that, uh, Professor McCanny, we got word that the missile surveillance system had been shut down as of August one. I saw an official news release saying it was closed down September one, or would be closed down September one. However, it closed down in August one, which makes no sense whatsoever. But they said it was because of uh, funding, of course, that they had to shut it down. Your comments on where the monies are going, sir? So, yeah, it's, that's a good point. Why would they shut that down? Uh, I am just baffled with that. But regarding NASA, uh, many years ago, in fact, it happened in about the mid-'90s, a guy named Dan Golden became the head of NASA. And I was very familiar with people in NASA at the time. Uh, I had to could pick up the phone and call a lot of people at Goddard or JPL. And at that time... He came in from the security agency end of the government, and his job was to shut down NASA, to put everybody that remained. They got rid of a lot of people. They did screenings, and only the people that would buy into this security program stayed. A lot of people retired, uh, but they were forced to sign re uh, gag orders, basically. They uh, uh, And uh, NASA divided at that point into what I call Tier 1 and Tier 2. The people you see in universities, the people that fly around to the American Geophysical Union meeting, et cetera, are what I call Tier 2. Uh, the Tier 1 scientists were picked out, the really good top-level scientists were picked out, given a high-level security clearance, and basically you don't ever hear from them unless they are told to say something. Uh, and so I saw this happening. Uh, so, yes, there is a Tier 1 side of NASA Sometimes these people come and talk to me. I've had them call me up and ask me uh, uh, about things that I know, yet the Tier 2 level of science denies me completely. They, don't, they pretend they don't know I exist. They all know about me. How could you not know about me? And you're in science. I mean, it's absurd. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, you, know, uh, uh, the, you know, the whole world public knows me. How do, so anyway, that's just an absurd part, but... But uh, they still promote the dirty snowball comet model, the fact that the, the concept that space is electrically neutral, something that's totally absurd. And it's like they're wallowing in molasses scientifically. Uh, and that's all by design. There's a, a forced level of bad science on the public, and I've mentioned this on your show before, that they keep the public intentionally stupid. And this is throughout history. Leaders have understood they have to keep the public stupid to control them. It's simply a control mechanism. If the public is too intelligent uh, about uh, uh, science and outer space, then they're hard to con control. That's right, and thus so, they yeah. want to eliminate uh, the fact that you exist or your information. Thank you. We honor you. We salute you at the Power Hour. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor McKinney. We'll have you back on very soon. This subject's not going away. Jay McKinney, uh, it's at the website. Go to the website and also to the email blog.